Welcome, Tim, to our podcast, Grow B2B Faster. I'm really happy to have you on our show. And let me start uh, by asking you a very simple question. Um, like, where are you right now and where are you living? <laughs> uh, Sammy, for a global audience, I like to say I'm in the greater Chicago area, but I'm actually outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, a couple hours north of Chicago, uh, but uh, where it's cold at this time of the year. Awesome. And before we dive into what you do in your in your uh, job and corporate corporate life, uh, tell us about something you you love doing outside of work. You know that has changed during a pandemic. What I really love to do outside of work, my wife and I like to do, and our kids. We have four daughters is we love theater. We love musical theater in particular. So we subscribe to all the shows we can and we go to as many as we can. It's been a little quiet these days. Uh, so now we just have our own family time, but that's what's special to us. Yeah, awesome. Um, so now tell me about uh, your comp the company you work uh, with, Corporate Vision, your company. Uh, what are you doing? So we like to say that we improve companies customer conversations and by that we are a consulting and training company and we work with marketing departments sales departments and customer success departments in the area of customer conversations the messaging the content assets and the actual skills with which to have those customer conversations we like to say that in a world where most of the products and services are more or less the same as your competitors It's the one who tells the best story in the best way that actually wins. Absolutely resonates with me. Is it a, a service only for B2B companies or is it also for B2C companies? It's primarily for B2B where there's mm -hmm. a more complex multi-step sales cycle that's involved, whether that's helping the marketing departments on the demand generation side or the sales departments inside and outside in selling or customer success, which handles renewals and upsells. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And what's your job at Corporate Vision? So I have the best job. Uh, I call it <laughs> uh, Chief Strategy Officer, which means that I, I get to speak into a lot of different things we do. Uh, the research, and we'll talk more about that, the product direction and development, the consulting and actual delivery of the work we do, and all the thought leadership and marketing rolls up under the strategy banner. Uh, but it also gives me a position on the executive team to help overall lead the direction of the company. So just, just one follow-up question here, because uh, I think that's interesting. You said you combine research and, and, and use research to, um, to implement something meaningful in practice. Can you, can you deep dive a second what you mean with that? Yeah, if people go to our website, you'll see we focus on something called decision science. Uh, all of our work is rooted in the behavioral sciences, such as behavioral economics, social psychology, and cognitive neuroscience. We like to say we like to understand and then help our customers engage their customers in, in the ways they frame value and make choices. And it's interesting how humans frame value and make choices and how you can impact and affect that Uh, is is where we like to put our messaging, content, and skills training. And, and we don't just rely on existing science. We do a lot of our own research, which we can talk some more about. Okay, amazing. Um, super interesting also because um, like my, my small company is in, is in a little part of what you do, basically demand generation or lead generation. And we, we really know that Uh, what you what you want to uh, provide as message and how you convey that message can make a, such a huge difference, and it really depends on the target group. So I really am curious in what we learn on this uh, small small podcast that we have here. Um, so my first question is: uh, What do you think do most marketing and sales organizations get wrong when they think about uh, how their potential customers make their purchasing decisions? Well, I think one of the things marketing and sales gets wrong is because our, our customers tell us this. Uh, when we ask our customers, what is it going to take for you to make a decision? They unwittingly lie to us. Uh, what do I mean by that? 
buyers or customers want you to think they're entirely rational, they're totally logical, in reality, that's not true at all. And so the thing that most marketing and sales teams get wrong is not understanding or underestimating the impact of the emotional, intuitive part of the decision-making process that especially happens in B2B, where when you go into B2B, you think, oh, everybody wants to hear the latest jargon and acronyms, and they check their emotional brain at the door because when you're in B2B buying, you just become a robot, <laughs> but not true at all. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what most marketing and sales teams get wrong is they think B2B decision-making is different than any other human decision-making. Yeah, we talked a lot, a little bit about it in our um, in our discussion before this podcast. It's it reminds me of um, the whole scientific um, era of, of finance in the beginning of of the I think two thousand and seven or eight when I did uh, study mathematics. It was super hip to go into uh, behavioral finance, and and now. Uh, basically, the, the sales and marketing teams um, also go into this era a couple, couple of years later. So that's super interesting. Well, I'm older than you. So I remember when the pivot went from rational economics to behavioral economics. And all of a sudden, there were people winning Nobel Prizes in economics who came from the psychology area, not the rational side. So you had Daniel Kahneman win. You, you had... Thaler, Richard Thaler win um, for the concepts of loss aversion and prospect theory and nudge and all these things. And all of a sudden, behavioral econ economics started to eclipse rational economics, to your point. And you kind of got there as that was getting hot. And we are absolutely seeing that understanding come uh, to B2B marketing and selling as well. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Um What's the biggest mistake you see sales organizations do when it comes to creating the, the perfect pitch for their product? Uh, they rely on, a, I would say, a, a, I like to say a 20 or 30 year old concept of probing for pain uh, or diagnostic discovery or marketing departments call it voice of the customer research. And maybe 20 or 30 years ago, that was novel and unique and you didn't pitch you, you diagnosed, right? Or you discovered. And that was interesting at the time, but now everybody's playing the 20 question game and customers are getting smart enough to it and tired of it where they kind of have a higher expectation that you see more people who look like them than they do. So why aren't you telling me something I maybe am missing or I don't know instead of asking me what I already do know. And uh, so we are under this, uh, impression that the customer knows exactly what's going wrong and what they need. And the customer, interestingly, is starting to realize because our company sees and serves a lot more people who look like them, we might actually know more than they do because we've got, uh, if you will, an entire portfolio of people trying to deal with this type of issue. Uh, and, and so when you go in, I always say, when you go in and you probe for pain and then you play that back for your customer, that doesn't make you a trusted advisor. That just makes you a tape recorder. Trusted advisors aggregate the knowledge they're getting, the benchmarking of other companies and, 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 and um, organizations they serve, and then bringing that intelligence to this new prospect or customer to help them see where they do or don't fit and what they might be missing or not taking advantage of. I could go in so many directions now. Um, the, so, so two things that popped into my mind. Um, the one thing is it's pretty similar to being a physician. Huh? You see um, people in your specialty all the time and they, they say they have a special kind of pain, but you know that something else could be the reason. And then you pull for, for what, what's the root cause and, and what you want to do in, in terms of helping them succeed. And the, the other one was, um, and that's because I'm a mathematician, I think of local maxima and global maxima the customer thinks that the hill, the highest top of the hill is like right next to them and that's where they want to go. But you have the big uh, binoculars. You can see much further because you see so many customers and then you go, can, can shoot for the really big hill and open their eyes. And that is super interesting. And that brings value to the whole conversation. I think that's maybe also what I see here, what you're doing, bringing value beyond just asking questions. Um, and and, and that's, that's a big value add that customers might perceive as well. 
Well, that's why I like to say that asking questions and playing them back makes you a tape recorder. When everybody wants to be a trusted advisor, all sellers I talk to want to be a trusted advisor and their companies say, you should be a trusted advisor. And the customer actually wants you to be a trusted advisor, but you don't achieve that status until you tell them something they didn't know about a problem or missed opportunity they didn't know that they had. We call these unconsidered needs. And you can't ask, uh, there, there are not enough questions in the world to ask a prospect or customer to get them to reveal an unconsidered need because by definition, it is unconsidered. And it is not the thing they know they're worried about, it's the thing they don't know, the thing they might be missing. And that's where they're hoping you're gonna bring some information and some ideas and some insight and some other experiences that they don't have to your point. So we like to uh, identify this concept of the unconsidered need is what you need to introduce to the customer and reveal to the customer because that's what it's gonna really take for them uh, to, to see this thing they might be missing. Can you give us a hands-on example of maybe, like you can anonymize it, of course, but uh, a customer that pops up your mind where you say, okay, this, this is really hands-on, this is how, or maybe someone who first ever hears about unconsidered needs can grasp it a little bit better. So I, I can give you two examples, one maybe a little more consumer-oriented that we can all get our arms around and then maybe one more technical. Um, so on the consumer side, uh, we worked with a company that uh, sells fireplaces into people's homes, and they were working with home builders to try and convince more home, the people who are building these homes to put a fireplace in, and not only put a fireplace in, but put a premium fireplace in. And, and so the unconsidered need we introduced in a very clever way, we thought, we, we said, ask the home buyer to write down three numbers. And I'll in invite people on the podcast who have a pen or paper near them to write these down. The number one, the number 710, 710, and then the number four. The number one is that all research in the last couple of decades shows that fireplaces are the number one indoor household feature that future home buyers are looking for. The number 710, if you put a little slash after the seven, it means seven out of 10 home buyers say fireplaces are a must have when they're looking to potentially purchase your home. And the number four put a percentage point, uh, percentage after that, 4%. Only 4% of homes install a premium fireplace. That means 96% of homes have your basic standard fireplace. What does that mean for you as somebody who's building a new home? Someday, if you wanna sell that home, you're going to want to have the number one household indoor feature and you're good. Otherwise you're going to reduce your market to only three out of 10 opportunities to sell. And maybe you want to consider upgrading to a premium because it will distinguish you from all the other homes that have fireplaces because 96% of them have a basic fireplace. What I will tell you happened is when we literally ask the salespeople to ask their customer to write down those three numbers and tell that story, the penetration rate went from five in 10 households having a fireplace in their new home to seven in 10. And the upgrade rate went from 4% premium to 40% premium. And all that changed was telling a story with a couple numbers. And the unconsidered need here was the impact on resale value and the, if you will, how smart your investment is or future proofing your investment if you put a fireplace in, which would otherwise just be one more of a myriad of discretionary decisions. So that one really like game changing sort of unconsidered need for the person who's making hundreds of decisions when they're building a home to make this one more important. The other one I'll tell you on the technical side is we're working with an organization that offers third party service to data centers. That means that if you buy all the equipment from an original equipment manufacturer, they are trying to come in and get the service contract and displace the service team from the original equipment manufacturer. And what they introduced to the data center owners now is that um, makers of this equipment put an end of useful or sort of, what do they call it? End of life or end of serviceable life timeframe on the equipment. But the reality is the useful life of that equipment is typically on average 50% longer than the original equipment manufacturer identifies because their job is to turn over the equipment. 
And so we help this third party uh, service provider introduce the idea of it's not about end of life or end of serviceable life. It's about the end of useful life. And that can be 50% longer. Let's extend your investment another 50% so you can save that capital for other projects. So it's introducing an unknown fact and putting a story around it that really creates the power of an unconsidered need. Um, two questions that pop up my uh, mind um, here. The one thing is how do you uncover this unconsidered need? And my follow-up question then is, is there a playbook to come up with a good story? So the, the unconsidered need, uh, you, you need to know that if you introduce it, it needs to land on something that you do well, right? It needs to lead to something that is distinct or advantaged by you and for you. So this third party service provider needed to um, introduce an unconsidered need that landed on their strength, which was the extending the life of equipment. And um, so unconsidered needs are really a reverse engineering project. You find something that is unique or advantage to you that the customer doesn't yet care about or think they need or realize how important it is. And you back that up and you say, what story do I need to tell? What need do I need to reveal? And then what data can I put on that? And what kind of emotional storytelling can I wrap that in so that somebody by the time they're listening, done listening to me is begging me for the answer or the resolution to that need. So the playbook is usually this idea of you need to uh, introduce this unconsidered need because you can't ask questions because the customer doesn't even know it exists. And the way you introduce it is by bringing up an interesting data point and then wrapping that data in a distinct sort of insight or story and then landing on a good question, which is totally reversed from old school, start with the question. Uh, we call it DIQ, data insight question, as opposed to the old, which was ask questions and then maybe give them some data and insight to show them how smart you are. And we've done research to prove that the data insight before the question is far more persuasive than asking the question and then sharing the data and the insight. In fact, our research showed that when we put people in those two different conditions, and then we ask them a bunch of questions afterward about how big is their need, perceived need, how important is this need to solve, and how impressive is the vendor's potential solution or the story they told, the data first versus the question first was shown to be double digit improvements in persuasive power, like 14% on average improvement in persuasive power, meaning people were more persuaded they had a problem that needed to be solved and solved urgently and more persuaded that you were a plausible vendor just by rearranging that structure, data insight question versus question and then data and insight. And it's a simple change with a material persuasive impact. It's amazing because, I mean, what you learn in one-on-one -on -one sales is you have to uncover the problem because without the problem, you cannot sell anything. And you take it for granted that the customer knows all the problem, but you basically create your own playing field by already knowing where you want to set up the field. You, uh, you lure the customer. I wouldn't say lure. It sounds so creepy. Um, you help them uh, discover their 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 really big existing uh, problem that they well, didn't have an, on top of mind. Um, and, and then, of course, you have the perfect solution because you reverse engineered your, 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 your questions towards your solution or your data point and question towards the solution. So it's, it's a clever way. I think the only, the only risk I see in this one is if, if you, have a, you have an idea as a company and say, okay, this, this is a great product, And, uh, and then you try to reverse engineer and it's uh, however you play it, you don't find this um, or you, you, you really cannot land with this, uh, with this uh, new playbook. Um, but I assume that if you have a product that's already working and uh, you basically take it to the new level with this angle, that then you have a higher success rate. But correct me if I'm wrong, is, is there like, do you have to have some basics in place so that you're successful or what has to be there? Um, so that you can get started with this. 
Yes, good question. So our model, the unconsidered need and what we call the why change messaging framework. Uh, in fact, I uh, was a guest lecturer at the Northwestern Business School called Kellogg, the business school here at uh, in Chicago and their entrepreneurial selling class. So these are people who were going for their MBA and they considered themselves entrepreneurs and they had an idea that they were trying to figure out how to sell. And they were using this model as their capstone project and our book as their text. And the professor would bring me into lecture on how to tell the story of the unconsidered need. Because here's the premise. When you are trying to sell something new to somebody, they have a current way of doing things. Either they're using a competitor in a familiar space or they're, they're doing something some way and you wanna show them a different way. In either case, you're asking them to make a change. And what you're trying to do is defeat their current bias. And we call it, well, we don't call it, scientists call it status quo bias. Humans live in status quo bias. They prefer to keep doing things the way they do because they like stability. And uh, persuasion is impossible until you defeat status quo bias. You, the, the buyer must believe or feel some level of uncertainty about their current approach, whatever it is, before they will even consider changing to do something else. Because change is so risky, you first have to make their status quo appear risky before change looks like a safe alternative. Uh, that's really good. I like it. So basically, it's it's for startups and for um, like we know big companies that have a legacy of products that work. Um, that is good news for everybody, I would say, and it makes sense. Yeah. Again, it's back um, to human psychology being true in business sales as well as anything else we decide in life. Absolutely. Um, let's let's switch gears a little bit, and let me ask you the following question. Um, what other big mistake do most sales playbooks make that should be fixed? So without wanting to sound too much like a commercial for our own research, but we released a new book last February of 2020 um, called The Expansion Sale. Because we continue to do research, we have a, a part of our company we call Decision Labs. So we do original research in, 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 in behavioral science, we do behavioral outcome-based simulations. We actually have a brain lab uh, where we put people in EEG helmets and, and we look at facial recognition, eye tracking, galvanic skin response, and we put people in simulations to see how they respond to certain messaging, certain stories, certain types of visuals. Um, and then we do field trials. We actually have a call center operating like an inside sales team and we run certain cadences and put messaging and content assets and voicemail scripts and the rest all into that and test. So we do a lot of testing. The bottom line on that is we did a lot of testing in the area of renewals and upsells, meaning existing customer expansion and discovered that uh, the approaches that you take, the, the approaches we just discussed for dislodging and displacing status quo bias don't work with your existing customers because you are the status quo bias. And so what we discovered is when you go in with guns a blazing to try and, and tell something really new and fascinating and unexpected to existing customers, it actually upsets their status quo bias, which is you. And they start saying, well, if I have to change this much anyways, I should consider all my options. And you literally just invited the competition in versus if status quo bias is real, maybe you need to reinforce defend or otherwise lean into that and tell your story on top of the good experience and the mutual investment and effort that everybody's made as an expansion story as opposed to a disruption story. And we were able to test that and prove that in renewals, uh, price increases, upsells, and apologies for service problems, that there is something called an incumbent advantage and you need to use that in your favor in other words, reinforce status quo bias as opposed to disrupt it. So what I would say is that it's not one size fits all. You need to, in your marketing and your sales and customer success, have an approach that's situationally relevant to acquisition, where you must disrupt and defeat status quo bias. And you must have an approach that is situationally relevant to expansion, where you reinforce and, uh, uh, and grow 
uh, with that customer. So we see two funnels for marketing. We see two processes for salespeople that take this um, different psychology into account. Can you give us a hands-on example, please, again? Yeah, so if um, it, we just talked about what you would do with a prospect and if they're doing something themselves or using a competitor, you must introduce unconsidered needs. When you go into an existing customer and you want them to buy, let's say, something new from you, what we've identified is you must first identify and document for them the business results and impact you've had to date and document the mutual investment and effort that both sides have made to date getting you to this place. That's what we call the incumbent advantage. It's like creating a firewall, building a moat around your relationship, something that, that protects you when the competitors come in trying to sell the same new thing and they're trying to like lob a grenade in there and disrupt the customer, you're building a protective barrier that says, uh, and there's two scientific principles at work here. Anchoring, you want to anchor them on the positive results and impact and momentum. People do not like to stop. Even if you haven't hit the goals 100%, they just don't like to stop positive momentum because the risk is you could go backwards. And you want to document the mutual investment and effort. The science there is called sunk cost. People don't want to redo investments in time and effort that they've already made. And that's what they're going to face if they make a change. And so the whole point is we can't expect the customer to just remember, think about, and process the impact and the investment that's been made. You have to remind them. So every good renewal story and every good upsell, cross-sell story begins with documenting the results and impact to date and the investment and effort both parties have made. So you anchor them positively and remind them of the sunk cost. And how do you make the switch then? Do you say, and by the way, we have something that helps you reach even further or how do you, how do you do that? Yeah, so the, the rest of the discussion then looks like a, sort of a, and, and so where do we go from here? And then you identify what we call um, evolving trends. And, and the idea here is you are now working inside their organization. So you have a perspective from that vantage point and you continue to work with other companies that look like them. So you have this unique perspective where you can look at what they're doing in the rest of their organization and what others like them are doing and say, here's our view as a trusted partner now, not just a potential advisor, we're now a trusted partner. Here's our view of the evolving, emerging trends. So it's not the disruptive, surprising, oh my gosh, we didn't see this coming. It's evolving and emerging. And it comes from your vantage point of being inside and knowing what they do and comparing it to the outside and then revealing to them, here are the next things you need to consider. So it's nuanced. You still have to emotionally address uh, the need to change, but it's in the protective context of the existing relationship and results that you now say, now let's take a further look. And, and that is the, the, the thing that happens for B2B companies that your competitors don't have when you're inside is you get to have things called business reviews. And so you don't have to act like it's some sales event. You can act like it's a partnership meeting where you can start to introduce these things as an analysis of your experience with them and compared to what you're seeing in the outside world. And they're going, thank you for that perspective. This was a very worthwhile meeting because I'm learning these additional things. And it's, it's not under the pressure of a, of a sale. It's in the comfortable confines of an existing contract where you can begin to introduce these things in business reviews. Um, that's a side question now, but um, how often would you say, does it make sense to have business reviews uh, with a B2B client? So, you know, we've, we've seen them, you know, it's funny because if there's a renewal involved, right? If there's like a subscription or some sort of a contractual agreement, there's a motion that happens when all of a sudden things turn commercial because you're in a re renewal sort of cadence. The business reviews need to operate after the sale, but before the renewal cadence. And some contracts are a year, sometimes they're two years, sometimes they're three years, sometimes they're month to month. So I don't have a data supported answer for how many business reviews you need to do. But my suggestion is that you do one or more of them before you hit the renewal cadence, because 
what our science showed us is nobody, once you hit renewal cadence, everything sort of locks down. Um, and so what you want to do is moving into the renewal, you want your customer going, hey, when we talk about the renewal, why don't you bring these things into it that you've already talked about or introduced us to? The goal being they're like asking you to bring it into the discussion because of your reviews versus you surprising them with it at the time of renewal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my gut feeling would have been that you may even can pick a time where you know there's a high chance that you can show first success. Um, but you're, you're, and you, you, can sh you can basically take this good emotion of having first success. And if you have something else that can add additional value, maybe that could be a good time. Uh, but that's not backed by data, that's backed by my gut feeling. Well, right. And, and like I said, everybody's ability to document success and the time frame that you can document success in. Um, and it just how long is the implementation and onboarding and path to success? Uh, I think that's a good rule of thumb to say is when you start to see some meaningful data that proves there is success, it's worth calling a meeting. And, and we don't have time to go into it. And the question really becomes, how do you make sure that executives come to the meeting who have decision-making authority versus the meeting being just a review of the implementation? And now who you have in the meeting is everybody who cares about adoption, utilization, and support and service questions. And, and that's not who you want in this review. You want executives who have decision-making authority in this review. So the key is making sure that the metrics you're measuring are at a level that will cause these folks to show up in the meeting. And that's perhaps the, the, the that we, we teach a whole course on that. It's called the triple metric. So we don't have time to get into it, but there is a way to think about project level. And then if you will, department or business unit level and then corporate level metrics and connecting the dots between all three of those layers, the triple metric, and making that make sense for the customer and making sure that the right deciders are in your business reviews. Absolutely makes sense. And I think you can do a lot of things right, even at the start of the whole contract, when you say, this is how we do it. This is what we will show you at that point of time. It makes sense that these guys are on board and, um, and, and maybe that's the easy way to do it, but that, um, that way you already have the buy-in from the decision makers who say, yeah, these are really important KPIs. I want to see that. And I think I have to invite you again to get the full playbook here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will tell you, I am totally mystified, Sammy. You are totally right. The, the business got sold based on some sort of business case, right? Some belief that certain things were going to happen and why those don't carry over more often. We see way too often when the implementation team starts to worry more about the project level numbers and uh, you know, like again, adoption utilization rates. And somehow everybody lost sight of the metrics or KPIs that people bought on. And, and we, we preach this, that very thing. These should carry over. These are not the business case for buying only. This is now the business case you will follow as you uh, document results and demonstrate impact. Awesome. So we are already coming to our end now, Tim which is almost sad. I would love to uh, find out much more. But as I said, I think this will not be our last interview if you are for it. Um, so let's wrap it up with five rapid fire questions. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Sure. Bring them on. What do you do to keep body and mind fit and sharp? <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I've been in this business a long time. And the thing that keeps me engaged is we literally have built a research. To, we have, like I said, a brain lab uh, where we bring studies in and we have a cognitive neuroscientist on staff. Uh, we have partnerships with social psychologists who run uh, behavioral outcomes based simulations. And we have our own testing lab of 10 person call center running these interesting studies. I don't get bored with uh, the world of B2B marketing and sales, because we're always uncovering, studying and uncovering interesting, counterintuitive and data supported concepts and theories. I always say that our, our, um, the world believes that we are data rich and theory poor, right? We have so much data, we don't know how to turn it into intelligence. I've said marketing and sales is theory rich, but data poor. And so we've tried to turn that around and say, we need real data. And that's what keeps it me, at least professionally, uh, sharp 
and fit. Uh, I certainly, as I go on in years, try to exercise and eat right and do a lot of spiritual feeding. That's very important to me. I read a lot in that area that uh, um, just kind of keeps you connected in, in, in a spiritual way. But uh, ongoing research, exclusive, original, fresh, um, not just relying on 30-year-old um, insight, that's what keeps it fun for us. Can you give us a, an example of of, um, of a book, like a spiritual book, as you said, uh, that that you really that helped you a lot? Um, that helped me a lot. I <laughs> there was a turning point in my life, uh, and it was a book by Billy Graham of all people. He's been around a long time and recently passed, and it was called Peace with God, and uh, it was a turning point that allowed me to realize that. I wasn't going to have peace on this side of eternity until I made peace with my maker and uh, old book, but profound book. And that was a very major turning point uh, in, in my life. Thanks for sharing, Tim. Um, can you also name a favorite business book? Well, so there's the corollary on the business side. Old school was Stephen Covey's Seven, Seven Habits. If if people don't say that was it, uh, then I don't know what they're reading, <laughs> because um, that was uh, that was long ago, but so memorable. And this premise of begin with the end in mind and now start living that way, right? He said, write your eulogy, and he write he, you write your eulogy what you want somebody to say about at your funeral. And his simple premise was now start living that way. <laughs> so that that's the result. And, uh, and there was so much more in there. Um, but for me also, I would just add that from a sort of behavioral science standpoint, the seminal book for me and the science and the work we do in buying and selling uh, is uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel prize for economics and he was the first psychologist to win that. And thinking fast and slow is just really, it's it's that genre's uh, foundational work, I believe. Yeah, funny enough, and Martin Mikos, uh, CEO of Hacker One, whom I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, named the same book. Thinking fast and thinking slow. Yes. There you go. There now. Yes. This is this is the thing. Now many more people will. So if you haven't read it, Sammy, now now you're gonna have to. So I have it in my bookshelf. I already told him I have to like sit down during <laughs> Christmas break and I have to because it's a thick book, huh? So it is. Uh, I, I always take joke. Time. I always joke. I go. It's thinking fast, thinking slow, and <laughs> reading even slower. I mean, it's it's both thick and thick, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what Martin said too. He sometimes said to read like a page twice or three times because it's so dense with information. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward well, to Well, so there was um, uh, Michael Lewis, who writes popular books, uh, wrote The Undoing Project. And it was about uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman and their partnership, which resulted in this Nobel Prize winning work. So if you want sort of the commercial version of it, you might read Michael Lewis's The Undoing Project, uh, as he did it sort of in a biographical way that uh, uh, is, is more entertaining, I guess you could say. Why, why not both? <laughs> there you go. Um, a favorite business leader you follow? So, you know, business leader, it's so interesting. Um, I, I, the thing about business leaders, if you've ever read a business book 10 years later, those leaders are no longer relevant and their approaches are no longer relevant. And, and you start to go, wow, what's timeless here, right? And uh, so in all honesty, um, that's a hard one for like a business leader. I am currently engaged with in a partnership and have been a fan of a man named Rory Sutherland. Rory Sutherland is the head of Ogilvy's Behavioral Science Institute. And he also runs a conference called Nudge Stock based on the Nobel Prize winning concept of nudging. And last year, 120,000 people were on the, not just registered, participated in this online conference that used to be an in-person conference. And it, it followed the sun. And I was just marveled at that. And so he's a brilliant thinker in the area of how behavioral science impacts business to business. And uh, in fact, we're doing a webcast together and uh, he's going to uh, be partnering with our decision labs. And so now I've kind of gone from business person I admire to someone who I'm going to be partnered with. So I'm pretty excited about that. Oh, that's great. Happy for you. Um, 
who should be our next podcast guest to help our audience grow their B2B business faster? So there are so many facets, right, of, of growing B2B. And uh, I, so I'm a big fan of uh, the, so let me back off uh, up a second. 70 to 80% of B2B business, your number and your growth is going to come from existing customers. And this whole movement around customer success, it's why we wrote, did the research and wrote the book, The Expansion Sale, uh, is, is just exploding. And uh, this guy's company just became a unicorn, a billion dollar company. He wrote the forward to our book, The Expansion Sale. His name is Nick Mehta. Uh, and he is the CEO of a company called Gainsight. And it's a technology company, but it's all about applying the discipline and rigor to customer success uh, like we've done for customer acquisition. Success was just sort of like, we, we believe it's going to happen because our products are going to work and people are going to love us and they're going to stay. And he's putting a discipline around it and then a technology to enable it. And I believe in that category and, and that companies are going to benefit maybe more so from customer success management than traditional customer acquisition management. So I think because 70 to 80% of our business comes from existing customers, Nick Mehta and his view on customer success might be very interesting for your B2B podcast, folks. I will try to reach out to him and get him on our podcast. It sounds super interesting and I absolutely buy into this notion of keeping your customers and expanding them. Um, if you do that right, you at least don't fall with your revenue and then um, you can still succeed with your acquisition of new customers. But if you have a leaky bucket, um, you can do lots of sales. Um, you just have uh, no, no good business in the long run. Yeah, I picture pouring sand into a sieve. You're pouring it in the top, but the pile keeps draining out the bottom. Then you're getting nowhere. So uh, if you, yeah. you want to make sure you plug the bottom first. Absolutely. And now um, you can directly address our audience. Anything they can help you with or you would like to ask them? So that's a, that's a good question. And, 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 and the thing about B2B, uh, is like I said, it's, it's sort of under explored or research. There's a lot more research done in, in B2C. And I would love to know like what questions people have that they think should be scientifically explored. Um, so to give you an example, we're in the middle of doing a bunch of research right now on effectiveness on web conference calls. So we'll just call them Zoom. What happens on Zoom versus in the room? And what happens to your presentation? What needs to be different there? What do you need to do different as a presenter? Now that you're like literally trapped in a picture the size of a postage stamp, like you're in a box and you're no longer in the room. And so we're doing all kinds of brain studies on how to most effectively get people to respond, motivate them, keep their attention, yada, yada, yada. And, and that's a hot topic. Um, so if somebody has other hot topics in B2B that like the changes are, are, are happening. Um, we'd love to study them, but we will take ideas um, from you all. Uh, we have our own ideas um, that we're testing. One more example of what we're testing currently is the impact of like static passive eBooks versus an interactive version of that same information that let's say you take the same exact content, but now it's more of an interactive assessment where you do some self-discovery and self-persuasion versus flat, static, passive ebook you just kind of read through and what creates more motivation and, and, and more energy and attention and things like that. Because we know more people are making decisions without a salesperson and they're engaging content. Well, what's the best content? So these are the kinds of things we're already looking at. We're open to more ideas for our research agenda. Awesome. How should people reach out to you to send you those ideas? Well, they can uh, go to Corporate Visions, our website, corporatevisions.com. Um, on December 17th of 2020, we will have launched Decision Labs. I'm sorry, B2Bdecisionlabs.com. B2Bdecisionlabs.com. That is our research firm. And I can be reached through emails in any one of those, or you can direct me, uh, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, or I'm on Twitter as well. And uh, just look me up and let me know that you heard uh, me on this podcast and that's how we can connect. Yeah, I will put all those links into the show notes so that um, our, our listeners can directly access you and awesome. uh, send you their questions or whatever else they want to share with you. 
Thank you so much for being our guest. It was super insightful. I took away a lot from my business, I can already say, and I'm pretty sure that our listeners did as well. So thank you so much, Tom. My pleasure, Sammy, and uh, happy to come back anytime.